Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Hi, I'm Jay Stewart. I'm the Chief Exec of uh, Gendered Intelligence, we're a small community interest company that works with uh, trans people, or young trans people in particular, and we do a lot of education as well. Well, we, um, a group of us who were working within the trans community and also had some um, roles within the academic world, came across a funding opportunity to um, um, work with young trans people. I mean, we basically put a bid together to work with a group of young trans people and make some art. That was back in 2004, 2005. It was called Sidentity, um, What's the Science of Sex and Gender? So it explored um, how the medical world uh, understands and speaks about sex and gender and trans experiences in particular. And obviously it was about placing young people's voices at the heart of that who'd had lived experiences of being trans or gender diverse in some way. Um, so after that project um, finished, we wanted to do more and in 2008 we constituted as an, uh, an organisation, not for profit, and um, we started from there really. Our aims are to increase understandings of gender diversity and to improve the lives of trans people and young trans people in particular. So it's really about um, thinking about how young trans people can have a quality of life similar to all young people or all people in society and um, really thinking about how education and increasing understandings plays a part in that. Um, so it's about empowering young people to, um, to be who they are and to, to have their own voice and to speak about their experiences um, which should be kind of met in a positive way by the rest of society and I think there's, there's a big gap um, around some of that. One of the things that we came up with back in the day was that by talking to young trans people we felt that there was a particular intelligence coming through from those young people about what it means to be a gendered person um, and we felt that going into schools or going into other sort of young people settings that um, there hadn't been an opportunity to think about gender in the way that young trans people were thinking about it so it was about trying to bridge some of that gap so we came up with this idea that you know everyone can be intelligent about gender and it's really kind of an educative kind of um, kind of need if you like. So I think sometimes trans people are kind of positioned as kind of um, as if something is wrong with us, as if we have like some sort of condition and therefore we need access to services in order to be um, fixed or treated and actually from my perspective it's as much about mobilising a sense of community around the identity of being trans or the identity of being gender diverse and I feel like that is more of a, the, the politic around that is around um, thinking about uh, minorities in our community, thinking about um, challenging norms in our society which are endemic I think when it comes to gender and our fixed understandings of what gender is as this kind of like binary picture. Mm. Um, so it's about empowering a discussion or a discourse around that rather than um, being sidelined as that something is wrong with us and the rest of society is also okay. It's kind of like a social model of disability kind of uh, idea, if you like, that, you know, um, people with disabilities, there's, you know, are, there's something wrong with them, there's something abnormal about having a disability, whereas social model of disability is saying society is not set up to include everybody in their differences. And so where the wrongness sits is actually within our institutes and within um, our systems and our thinking, our kind of normal thinking. So it's kind of politicising some of that stuff, I think.
the gender identity disorder label has been changed to gender dysphoria. So it's still there within our DSM and within the, um, the kind of the framework of psychiatry. And I find that problematic. And I think um, it's, we're at a time in history where we need to be thinking through what does coming out of that set of frameworks kind of look like? How can trans people be fully depathologized um, without losing access to treatment and without losing access to uh, multiplicity of, you know, of, uh, of, of, uh, of choices, if you like, that, you know, so that trans people can make choices that are right for them. Mm. So I think we have a complex relationship with psychiatry and with um, um, the services that offer um, medical intervention or physical intervention. So similarly, I think sometimes it's useful to talk about trans being part of the LGBT community. So with lesbian, gay, bisexual, obviously there is a history of pathology around homosexuality as well, and that has been depathologized, although obviously lesbian, gay, bisexual people still experience discrimination in society, we can kind of think, well, it's not a mental illness or it's not a mental health condition to be a lesbian or gay or bisexual person. Similarly with trans, we should think the same, and I think generally we do, but of course, if we want to have access to physical interventions which needs to be regulated through medical practitioners or um, NHS services or other health services, what is that? relationship and how can everyone, including the practitioners and clinicians, be safe within that setting. And I think it's really complex. I um, fully support an idea of autonomy over our bodies and I think there are wider debates there around everyone having a fundamental say in their bodies. Um, and I think from a trans perspective, it's also very important that trans people feel that this is their body, these are, you know, this is my body, and I have a say <laughs> over what happens. Um, I, or, I don't agree with your thing around equating that to a kind of unrestricted access, because that for me makes it sound like there's a kind of loosey-goosey aspect to that, and I think we do need to have regulation, and I don't think uh, trans people are against that. We need to keep safe, and we need to have systems and processes where trans people can explore their options that are right for them, and obviously you can only explore your options if you have full access to all the information that's available. So I do think we need to have processes to allow that. Um, so we wouldn't collapse those two things together, I don't think. Mm. But I think there's a real principle at the moment around, or a, a real um, kind of, there's a, there's a sort of political drive, if you like, for this idea of self-determination or self-identification. And actually, we're seeing legislation looking to shift now where it's not for a doctor or for a judge to tell me what my gender identity is, that is for me to do. Um, and we, we are gonna see a kind of loosening off of that kind of like paternalistic kind of attitude from, um, from the medical establishments and from the uh, state, essentially. Um, we do a lot of work in schools, colleges and um, universities and other education providers. We feel it's a fantastic opportunity to talk about gender because of the environment that it sets up, it's a learning environment. Um, more and more young people are coming out as trans or are sharing their um, questions with other people around their gender identity. And so that means that there are staff on the ground who feel uncertain as to how to work best with those young people. So we're seeing a lot of training needs coming through. Um, about 50% of the training that we deliver at Gents Intelligence is in the education sector. 
Um, so there is a kind of a need and an appetite to engage with ensuring that young trans people are happy and safe at school. Um, we do mentoring, so we're not counsellors or therapists, um, but we are a trans-led organisation and I think for some it's really useful for young people who are thinking about being trans or identifying as trans to have some reference points. And obviously there's the media and there's representation in the media, but we might kind of be curious about that, around whether that's kind of like a positive or a negative thing. Um, my view is that there's nothing more powerful than meeting other trans people and gathering and connecting as a community. Um, we do understand that there's a lot of isolated young people out there who um, have never met any trans people before. So our mentoring sort of seeks to address some of that by um, um, offering a mentor who has got a trans experience or is identifying as trans to just do a little bit of work around goal setting. But um, within that piece, we're quite practical. So it's about what does that young person want to happen? And often the young person might say, I want to socially transition in my school. I want to be called a different name. I want a different pronoun used. And so we will kind of like advocate for some of that and represent some of that with the staff and support the staff um, with moving forward and, and, and seeing that that's an okay thing to do, that that's you know, totally possible and that actually that young person has some rights to ask for that. Um, so we're kind of like a bit of a broker, um, but also um, a supporter and an ally to both staff and students. We do a lot of PSHE workshops or we'll do school assemblies as well and that's just kind of broad key messages to all students to know that um, it's okay to be trans and it's okay to be different and we need to be celebrating differences in our, our communities um, and to, um, to think about kindness and um, acceptance and things like that, so sort of broad messages that young people tend to really respond positively to. Um, I think um, it can vary, there are lots of practical considerations, there are lots of complex scenarios, so young people might have very complex set, set of circumstances with their home life or um, other things, accessing other services. Um, so sometimes they want support or another voice, if you like, around the very specific circumstances that they're faced with. But also there are lots of kind of general concerns around general things like name changes and um, changing practices, trying to think about language, um, um, using a different pronoun, supporting someone in their social transition, um, thinking about parents as a key cohort in the school community and how we can support parents as well. Um, I think schools generally lack guidance from above, if you like. So we all go into schools and it can be very ad hoc as to whether senior leadership team feel confident about this issue, that they feel quite kind of solid in terms of this is the right thing to do. Um, and it's hit and miss. So some, I mean, some young people who we work with in a youth group setting will be at schools where their schools are just not engaging and would never engage with an organisation like GI, they're sort of wiping up the swipe, like putting it under the carpet. Um, but generally if the phone's ringing from a school then obviously that's, that's a really good sign already and it means that schools were keen to engage. Um, so it's a bit hit and miss and I think from, from my perspective it just needs a bit of sort of national kind of um, I don't say homogenising, but a kind of national um, set of guidance that will be useful for all settings um, to feel like this is what legislation says, this is what the right thing, this is what good practice looks like. Because we can go in and sort of do that, but we're more sort of very voluntary sector. So, you know, it's a kind of, well, it's good practice and these people say it, but if we have some more kind of powerful people saying that or powerful bodies saying that then I think it could be very productive 
and just reassuring, like reassuring that those staff members that they um, that they they're doing the right thing, supporting you know the diverse young people and children within their school settings. Smashing patriarchy, <laughs> smashing the gender binary. Um, opening up opportunities for everyone to express their gender in rich and diverse ways so people don't feel boxed in. Boxed in. Um, it's an interesting question around what real measures of success kind of look like. We'd like to see some legislative changes. Um, we're changing hearts and minds, that's a long term piece, shifting culture. We need to challenge basic stuff like gender stereotyping. We need to give children and young people an opportunity, all the opportunities that are available, not just because they're a boy or a girl. Um, I think you know there's lots of initiatives around getting girls into STEM subjects now. Um, I think we need to be building on some of those projects as well. Um, I think boys typically are also um, more restricted in terms of what is opened up, what is you know what opportunities they have. Um, so I think we might see more celebration of expressing femininity or what we understand as femininity um, on male bodies. So another thing that we've just started is um, one of the things that we've acknowledged within the work we do with young people and with parents and carers is there's a real um, gap in services around accessing therapy and counselling. Um, some of our young people and families have had negative experiences accessing mental health services and sort of counselling and therapy and one of the things that we feel we can do whilst we do not deliver therapy and counselling is to support and offer ongoing consultation um, and also create a network for therapists and counsellors who are working with gender diverse children and young people and adults as well. Um, so we've started a network, it's, um, it's a, a kind of um, package of support, it starts off with a two day training session so people sign up onto that and get some really good um, opportunities to explore gender within those settings but also thinking about language, thinking about legislation, thinking about some of their systems that they've got in place, are they attracting trans people into their services, um, you know, are those trans people being respected as the gender that they're identifying as, is it a safe space to explore their gender identity and we're teaming up with Amanda Middleton from Pink Practice to do that. Um, we're also then offering ongoing consultations, so it is not just a kind of one-off training piece, it's about ongoing work where people can come back and share their casework with us and we can discuss that as a group. Um, so hopefully that's also something that people find really valuable um, and will really help you know, trans people having a kind of therape therapeutic opportunity um, to explore um, their identity and who they are in a safe setting. So I don't really think that is happening um, as, as well as it could be. Um, so if people want to um, go on our website, it's genderedintelligence.co.uk. We've got a Twitter handle, at Gender Intel, um, and we've got a Facebook page as well. So there's lots of ways that people can contact us and we, um, we recommend you do any, anything that feels right for you. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.